Bless your Lord. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we might come to realize the spirit of your word. Lord, you wrote this book, and we thank you for it because we have something that we can look at and judge what's going on in our life and judge our own lives if we are we doing those things that are pleasing to you. So, Master, I pray that you continue to open our minds and our hearts to receive your word, that it would be implanted, be a part of us, that it would be our nature to be obedient to you and to delight ourselves in you, to be children that are pleased to be called your children, to be obedient children. Lord, that we would give our will into your hands and just trust you 24-7. So, Father, I pray that we might walk in faith, that we might find the liberty that's in Christ, the freedom that's to be, from, to be free from sin and to be free to serve you is a delight to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to be filled with your joy, your peace, your kindness, your goodness, for that to fill our hearts, Lord God, that we might represent you accurately in everything we do and say. So, Father, bless this time. Be glorified. Again, open our hearts and our minds and receive your word. Again, that you might be glorified. Bless your church as only you can, and we ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Bless the Lord. Please be seated. Uh, you know, honestly, this, th th this thought just keeps reoccurring to me. If partial obedience, if partial obedience was okay, why did, it why did Jesus even bother coming? Because everybody's partially obedient. I mean, you, you take the worst criminal you ever find, he'll, he'll have something good to say, you know. Uh, I mean, most people, if you, you know, if you want to introduce people to the, to the Lord, they'll say, well, I never killed anybody. Well, that's one thing. That's, it's good not to be a murderer, you know. But are you a thief? Are you a liar? Are you? To be reconciled to God took an incredible price to be paid for that to happen. And it couldn't be any sacrifice. You know, again, the thousands of lambs and bulls and goats and rams and turtle doves that were sacrificed did not satisfy the offense that was given in Adam. And all mankind makes that same offense where we re disregard what God said and do what, what's right in our own eye. And, and you know what's sad? It, it, what's, what's sad is to be a Christian and never come into the, uh, the fullness of what God has for you, to never find that place of just peace where I'm going to walk with God, I'm going to trust, trust God. No matter what my circumstances are, I'm going to trust him. And all I can ever do is what, what's right to do. You understand? You can't do more than that. There are some circumstances you can't change, but you can do right. You can always do right. You can always do what God would require you to do. And you know what? Then the problem becomes his problem, and he does save. And he, and he, can, he can change the heart. He can change circumstances. He can change uh, anything. Our, our God is able. You understand that there's nothing that's impossible with God. You know, we, of course, we, we want to work that, like, to get things, but nothing's impossible with God. No matter what situation you're in and what you're going through, God is able to grant grace. He's able to deal with it, your circumstance and to help you through the circumstances. He might not eliminate certain circumstances in your life, but he'll take you through those circumstances, and you can go and walk through anything assured that God is with you. And the greatest assurance you can have, I don't know if there's anything more comfortable than having peace with God because my peace comes here. It's a moot point what happens in my life. The only thing that matters to me is do I trust Jesus and do I walk in faith and do I do what I'm, I know I'm supposed to do? Everything around me and what goes on, good, bad, or indifferent, he allows to happen. And in the situation I find myself in, all I can do is what's the right thing for me to do in that situation. There are situations where the right thing to do was nothing. There's a situation I've been in, the right thing to say was nothing. There's times I've been in situations and it was time to say something. And you, you, and how do you do that? By faith, by what you believe, by what's in your heart. You know, not seeking your own uh, glorification, not patting yourself on the back, but just looking to be pleasing to God. You know, and you humble yourself and do what God would have you to do. Uh, there is, you know, how do you recognize your own arrogance? When you think you know, be careful. When somebody, when you cannot be corrected, somebody tries to tell you something, you just call it, it's always blowing it off, and you think they don't know what they're talking about. God could take anybody and minister to you. 
Balaam's donkey ministered to him. And the donkey caught it, got it before Balaam did. He, he got it. Balaam didn't. So be careful of thinking, well, some people like, well, if pastor will tell me it's okay, but if Joe Blow or somebody, my brother, sister, there tries to tell me, hey, I'm down the road further than they are. That thought is arrogant. I mean, you're down the road. For, how do you know where you're at? I mean, I hope you're at peace with God. I hope you feel good to, about the way you're living. But I hope you don't think that, man, I got it dialed in. I understand this whole thing. And everybody I judge, my judgment is right. You're judging. I mean, your judgment is right. If you're judging, and you have contempt in your heart towards people. And there's brothers and sisters that you don't love and don't care about, don't even want to be around. You know, like, don't touch me, don't be around me. You're arrogant. And you're in trouble. God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. You know, I want to teach on water baptism because I've got a few people that want to get baptized here pretty soon. And uh, I thought I'd teach that. In fact, I think I taught it in January, but I, it's always worth repeat, repeating because there's, there's so much in there. Baptism. You, you understand that theologians and You know, arrogant people depend on knowledge, and they think not, if you have knowledge that you have the answers. And you know what knowledge does? Makes you arrogant. Knowledge puffs up. If you can spout things off, and you know this, and you know that, pretty soon you're going to think you're something when you're nothing, because all you have is knowledge. Do you have any character? Are you humble? Do you walk with God? Do you honor God? Do you honor each other? Do you respect man that's made in the image and likeness of God? You know, what kind of person are you? Are you a know-it-all? Know-it-all can judge everything, and you can't tell them nothing because they know it all. And be careful. That spirit can creep into you. You get a little knowledge that somebody else don't have, or you spout off some things that nobody heard before, and all of a sudden you think, man, I'm... A spiritual person goes along with God's program and loves his brother and sisters and does all things without contempt, serves with pleasure. I would say if you're a spiritual person, something you ought to love for sure is church. There's a lot of people out there born again and don't go to church because they don't love church. The church is the body of Christ. If you say you love Jesus and you don't love the church, the truth is you're a liar. You don't think you're a liar. Well, I've been, to, I've been to church, you know. I tried that. I didn't like that pastor. I didn't like this. I, okay. So God says, you know, forsake not the assembly yourself together, but you can forsake it because you judge that that pastor don't know what he's talking about. But his life's more together than yours is. Hear what I'm trying to say to you. How do I know I'm led of the Spirit? The Spirit never leads you contrary to this book. Never. The Holy Spirit wrote this book through men, but he wrote this book. It's inspired of God, and without the Holy Spirit, the truth is you can't even understand that book. People who don't have the Holy Spirit say that book is confusing. Once you have the Holy Spirit, you don't see any contradiction in it at all. From Genesis to Revelation, it's just there's a flow, and there's a revelation of God, and an understanding of God, the understanding of God's ways. We come to know God by the... Revelation of the Holy Spirit with the scriptures. The Holy Spirit reveals the scriptures to you, and you understand the liking and disliking of God. If you're arrogant, God doesn't like you. If you humble yourself, he loves you. You know, you know this. is a. I know God hates gossip, and yet people gossip. I know God hates complaining, and yet we complain. But we think, but I have a complaint. Oh, well, that's okay then. Let's hear it. Everybody who complains thinks they have a complaint. Do you give it to the Lord? Do you get your, give your complaint to the Lord? Do you lay it on him? Do you get counsel how to fix it, or do you just go around grumbling, complaining, and a bad move, and woe be it unto me, and life's not fair, and why does he get something and I don't? Are you jealous of successful brothers and sisters, or does it thrill your heart? If you had a brother or sister pull up with a brand new Mercedes and, and you're driving a, 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 
a 15-year-old car that barely runs, and you see that, are you like, hmm, why does he get that? Somebody probably gave it to him. But we, instead of, wow, what a car. That's nice. Can I see it? Look. We're not jealous. We're blessed. You know, if you're not connected to the body of Christ and you don't love the body of Christ, do you realize how many blessings you're missing? I'm blessed in this life. I've had many, many blessings. But if you're related rightly to the body, I have a thousand blessings. Every testimony of somebody's life, every time one of the brothers or sisters, something good happens to them, I'm blessed. You bought a new house. Ooh, I love it. I'm blessed. You got a new car. I'm blessed. You know, your child just graduated from college and did good. Your daughter was a homecoming queen. You're blessed. I'm blessed. We rejoice with those that rejoice. If you're not doing that, you're in your own little world. You're, you might be in the body, but you're not of the body. We rejoice with those that rejoice. We weep with those that weep. We laugh with those that laugh. We, we share life. We're, and if you're not doing that, what are you doing? Waiting for it to happen? What to happen? Bless the Lord. Now, I was talking to a sister the other day, and we are talking about the next level. I, we've been really pondering that, the next, the next level. The next level, when we, when we advance in the Lord, when we grow in grace, the, the next level of his presence comes when he does it. I can only do the best with the level I'm in. You know, in the temple, and I was thinking about that, when the temple was finished and they were in there and they dedicated the temple to the Lord, the glory of God came. And they, they couldn't even stand. But the glory of God filled the temple. They didn't make that happen. God made it happen. All we can do is by faith, be obedient, keep a right spirit, serve God to the max, and he will reveal to you. He will increase your character. He'll, he'll, his presence will be greater to you. You'll have a greater understanding and insight of the things of God. So you can't twist God's arm and make something happen. You can only be obedient to him. And when you're told, Jesus didn't cause the resurrection. He went to the grave. He, was, he went to the grave. God raised him from the dead. What do we do? We're to walk in faith. We're to be obedient. We're to do the things we, we, we know to do. We're to honor the word of God. We're to live the word of God. We're to be Corinthians 13 in our nature. And we're to be people who keep the commandments and love God's word and do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You know, it, it, it's shame when people come and ask counsel of what to do in a situation. And to, what if you were in that situation, what would you have, what would you like people to do for you? Well, do for them. It's pretty pretty easy. You know, discern what you should do. Well, if you ask somebody to help you, you would be blessed if they helped you. Well, if somebody asked you to help them, do you need to pray about it? Don't need to pray about it. Bless the Lord. Anyhow, I'm just, we didn't need Jesus to come if we're just going to be partially obedient. Come on, under the law, you could be partially obedient. You know, if I keep nine of the commandments, that's not too bad. But if I miss one, you know, if I'm a coveter, you're not going to enter the kingdom. Jesus is not looking for 90%. He's looking for us to become his children and we have a father who has no spoiled children, who he loves dearly, paid a price for you and for me. But if you don't walk with him and you don't honor him, he will discipline you. How bad will he discipline you? Whatever it takes. Come on, I've said this before, I say it from the pulpit. I, I, there's times when people pray a sinner's prayer. Lord, save me. Come into my heart and save me. I really believe there's times God needs to say, or you're sure you want to go through that because you don't know what you lack. And sometimes getting in you what you lack is harder than getting the bad out of you. If you see the bad, it's easier. You repent of that. You confess it. You, you shun it. You deal with it. You battle it. You push it out of your life. But there's things you lack. You know? You're not appreciative. Well, how about this? I think one of the greatest lacks probably in America is not recognizing the grace in other people. I would pray that everybody you know, that you recognize there's something unique about them. There's a grace they have that I'd like to have, that I need to imitate. That's how we learn from each other. If you don't spend time with the body of Christ, 
you're going to miss things. You know, there's things that people do that are just, just nice and considerate and things I never think of. I go, wow, that was pretty nice. But I want to learn from it and imitate it. So do that. Bless the Lord. There are people who, who serving comes naturally. And there are some of us that, that we have to war if we want to serve or not. Like, oh, you know, I don't, somebody else will do it. But live this thing. Live your salvation. You know, if you got some issues to go through, you can only do in that issue what you can do. So do it. I hope I'm even making sense to you. I don't know that I am. But I pray that uh, we've come to we've come this far. Let's keep going. You know, if you're being obedient to the Lord, great. If you're 90% obedient, I'm really proud of you, but that's not good enough. When I say obedient, I'm talking about obedient to the word. That, that's what I'm talking about. Now, if you're obedient to the word, you will be obedient to leadership. You will be submitted one to another. You'll love, if you're obedient to the word, you'll love one another. If you're obedient to the word, you will praise God. You will lift up holy hands. You will pray. You'll do those things. If you're obedient to the word, when you go home today, you should have a discussion about what you learn in church. Now, if you don't, you think you've already arrived and you don't need that. I mean, is it a good, what, what, what excuse would you have for not doing that? How about if it's just a, a husband and a wife? Have the conversation. What would you get today? Do they even on the way home? What if you're by yourself? Get your notes out. I don't take notes. We'll give you paper and pencil. And, and if you wrote, if one scripture spoke to you, write it down and read it over. It helps solidify it in your life. You know, I, it frightens me that we have this laid back American Christian attitude of like, well, I'm saved. Okay, I'll do those things because it's nice to do, but I'm saved. You're sure of that? Well, yeah, my pastor told me. Hmm. Okay. Is the Holy Spirit bearing witness to you? Are you filled with the Spirit? Do you have the fruit of the Spirit 24-7? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and all those wonderful. Do you have that? Is that in your life? But you're saved. And here's my saying, I hope so. You know that you're to assure your salvation? You're to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What do you put before God? What do you miss church over? I mean, it's a question. Is it really okay? There's only one first, and that's God. If you don't put God first, then, then here's the other question. What is so hard about that? God is good. You come to know God. You grow in relationships. You grow in revelation. You grow in understanding. You grow in peace. Honestly, it's really nice to be in the midst of whatever is going on in the world and to be at perfect peace. I know that these things are going, could knock on your door. You know, if you lived in some of those cities where and you live downtown and they're burning the cities and breaking windows, and if you live there, well, you, I wouldn't want to live there without the peace of God. Jeez, you'd have to run and hide or get scared. That, it's awful what's going on. You can't throw God out the window and even think that a country can survive. And if the church is an example of how to live, who is? It's not just the preaching of the word. If this doesn't produce fruit in your life and you're not out there and people see there's something different about you, something they like about you, something about you that entices them to talk to you, to want to know you, and, and even when you invite them to church, you're willing to come because there's something special. We like the way you get along with your wife. We know your children listen. Boy, you guys get along. seem like you enjoy each other. You understand? How, do you, if you really think out in a world that everything is hunky-dory, it's not. It's only hunky-dory with believers. You can't have a good relationship without Christ. 
You can have a superficial relationship and don't even like each other. People don't, there's people who don't even like each other, live together. No one, when I grew up in, in the, the husbands and wives who didn't like each other stayed together for their children. They at least had a moral standard, but it's for the children. We stay together for the children. As soon as the children are gone, man, I'm done, we're done with each other. It was a long wait, tough journey. And the children really grew by example. <clears throat> Bless the Lord. We get the daughter baptism. What am I trying to drive home to you? Not paranoia, but be serious about your salvation. Put God first. Why? Because he is first. There is no first past him. He is it. And if you honor God and walk in faith, watch what happens in your life. It'll be good, and you'll obtain a testimony. And the testimony will say, look what the Lord has done. And what I love about the Lord, he'll even pay, he pays attention to even details. But anyhow, I want to get to this water baptism. Let's, let's look at the scriptures about water baptism. You know, there's theologians that debate the issue. Do you have to be baptized? Do you not have to be baptized? It's not even an issue. If you, if you give your heart to the Lord, go get in water. If you're the thief on the cross and you can't come down and you're going to die before you get off the cross, well, God will give you a pass. But it better be good. It isn't like, well, the water is too cold or I don't know about it. Or God is just. Listen to the scriptures, though. Matthew chapter 3. Says, now in the days of John the ba- excuse me, now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can only enter the kingdom through repentance. If you don't repent of your sin, you're not going to become a partaker of the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You change your whole spirit, change the realm you walk in. It's a spiritual realm. And they were being baptized by him, by John the Baptist. It was a baptism of repentance in the Jordan River, and they confessed their sins. And I want to tell you, they had faith, because I've seen the Jordan River, and I wouldn't want to get baptized in it. So you had to have faith to get in that muddy water. But anyhow, they did that. But people were, confe- people were coming and openly confessing their sins, and they were being baptized, a baptism of repentance. They were saying what they were guilty of, what they needed to repent of, and they were being baptized of a baptism of repentance. Preparing the way of the Lord. Do you understand? All those people who got baptized in John's baptism, when they heard the message of Jesus, got baptized in Jesus' name. That, re- that wasn't enough. You also need the baptism that's going to bring you the Holy Spirit, or you're going to find yourself going back and needing to repent again. But isn't it amazing that John the Baptist, listen to this, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, that was the ministers, right, coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Why would he do that? My honest opinion, it's an opinion. They weren't preaching the word of God. They weren't teaching the law of God. They were making excuses. They were exalting themselves. They were robbing widows and doing long prayers and raising money. They were just they're doing what people do. But, you know, we, you know, there's people that hate Trump. You know what? There were people that hated John the Baptist. There were people that hated Jesus because he spoke the truth. The, the unique thing about Jesus and anybody who's really of the truth, you speak the truth without contempt. You, you don't speak the truth like I'm up here and you're down there. You speak the truth because you love and embrace the truth and you're of the truth. That's why you speak the truth. Again, and I know I say this often, I say it again. Jesus said, I don't condemn you, the words I speak to you. There was no contempt for human beings in his, in his heart. He didn't look down his nose like he was better and he's preaching down, he's trying to straighten them out. He spoke the truth. That's what we're to do. You speak the truth you speak the truth because you love the truth and you care about people. Now look what John the Baptist goes on and says to, he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, therefore bring forth truth in keeping with repentance. Don't just say I repent. You stole something, bring it back. You cheated somebody, make it right. You offended somebody, go, go apologize. Make it right. Bring fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say we're saved doesn't say that, but you know, to the Jew, it's the same thing. We have Abraham for our father, you know, 
I'm a child of Abraham. Like that's my license to heaven. For I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. I mean, you can't say I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist. Well, I go to work and come to church. That, okay, it doesn't make you saved. It makes you saved because you walk in faith and do what God would have you to do. That, that you, and, and by the way, repentance isn't a one-time thing. Anytime when you smart off to somebody, you cop an attitude. As soon as the Holy Spirit goes, look what you did, you better learn to repent right then. Don't go, I'll take care of it later. Uh, God, you're in second place. I really don't need to honor you now. I need to do what I'm doing because it's more important than me being right with you. Did that anybody? The Holy Spirit convicts you. You know when you do it right then. Here, I'll give you some wisdom, too, to keep right with God. If somebody says, hey, uh, well, you got a message. Pray for the Channing family. Brother Buck's brother passed away. When you read that, you know what you should do when you read it? Father, bless the Channing family. Comfort them right now. Lord, let this time of sorrow be turned to joy, Lord, that they were comforted that Link, Link knew you, Lord, and is with you. You know when to do that? When you're reading it on your phone and when you just read it. Because if you don't, you know what you're going to do? You're going to forget. You're going to get tied up in what you're doing. And then you'll see Brother Buck and you go, uh, uh, sorry about your brother. And you can't say, I prayed for your family. And if you do, you're lying, unless you, under your breath, you say a quick prayer right then and try to do it, you know, like, don't, don't do that. I mean, learn to do that. It's important. I mean, you say your prayer right then. You know, when I had a disciple shop, I got saved in the disciple shop. Somebody comes and say, pray for me. I'm in a disciple shop. Let's, let's go in the storeroom and say a little prayer and come back out. And they're everywhere. Learn to do that. Learn to do that. Anytime a request comes down a prayer chain, pray then. I mean, I mean, after all, it's going to take you at least, if it's a long prayer, probably 45 seconds. And I know you're all so busy that, I mean, some of you got it. But God is able to make anybody a Christian, to be a Christian. And I love this. The axe is already laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, listen to this, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit. I pray you're growing in grace. I pray you're changing. I pray you have the fruit of the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit you're supposed to bear. That's supposed to be a part of your life. And if it's not, you're not growing in grace. Now, if you go to at most evangelical churches, will tell you to bear fruit is to win people to Christ. We should be doing that. We should be a witness. Apostle Paul says people don't know it, so you're ashamed. We're supposed to share what we know. We're supposed to share the gospel. But if you're not bearing this fruit in your own nature, if you don't have that peace that passes understanding, you need to grow in grace. Are you still on a head trip? Are you still ragged? Are you still... Judging everybody and everything, they should do this and he should do that and we should do this. You know, the only person I can control is me. So do that and let God take care of your problems. But look what John the Baptist says. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. Now listen to this. But he who is coming after me, listen to this phrase, is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Do you know that Jesus was John the Baptist's cousin? He said that about his cousin? A lack to me in America because of our independence. And by the way, I love our freedom and our independence. I love not critic, but because it's like everybody thinks they're equal to everybody else. And you know you're not. You're going to vote for a president here. I hope that you go vote. Uh, if you see those men as equal, just vote for either one of them. I don't see those men as equal. I see one man having much more brains, much more talent, and much more decisive than the other men. They're not equal. They're both human beings, but they're not equal in their abilities. Just like if you go to, and you want to have surgery done, do you want a guy that has the tremors to do your surgery, or do you want a guy that got a cold hand? They're not equal in their ability to do that. Can we all be equally saved? Can we all know the Lord? Absolutely. But do we all have different roles and different things we do? 
and for you to recognize the grace in another person. It's a gift. You can only do that if you're humble. But if you're arrogant, you, you, know, you, know, you don't see nothing. You just see yourself. He said about Jesus, he's mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. Is there anybody in your life that you look up to? Hmm? Is there? Speaking of Jesus, and his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear the threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. What is the wheat and the shaft? The wheat has life in it, and the shaft doesn't. If you're a believer, you need to be full of life. You need to love life. You need to live life to the fullest. Don't just be an empty shell, feeling sorry for yourself, playing the victim role. Nothing good ever happens to me. With that attitude, nothing good will ever happen to you. Who wants to help you? You're pathetic to be around. Come on, church. The only way we can take the church to another level is for, for us all to grow up and deal with our shortcomings and get them dealt with. And that's enough putting up with them. I'm not going to do that anymore. This thing of uh, being married and getting in arguments, having contempt and arguing with brothers and sisters and having an attitude, that that's, stymies you in your Christian growth. You pray for your brothers and sisters. You love your brothers and sisters. You do good for them, even the ones that take advantage of you. So what? Do you understand the only thing that matters in life is getting to heaven? How do you get to heaven? Please God. If I'm not pleasing to God, I'm up the creek without a paddle, church. Do what's right. Now, I mean, I'm saying all that is that it don't have to be a drudge rate and burdensome to you. If it's that, you still don't get it. Walk in the joy of the Lord. Walk in peace. Just, if you know you got a shortcoming, deal with it. How about this? Like, well, I got a habit of doing this. Every time you do it, repent. And sometimes you'll go, well, I did it again. Repent again. Repent again. Repent again. Repent again. I've been walking in this thing for 40 or 50 years. Sometimes I repent daily. I, I never go on, oh, well, Lord, what's the use? I'm, 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 I'm beyond help. Or if you really believe that, then you might as well go live in sin and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because there's pleasures in sin for a season. That season comes to an end, though. Usually a crashing end. But there's, God says, I wish you were hot or cold, not lukewarm. Not, eh, your Christian walk, eh, that there's things you like more and there's things you, you reject. But my Christian walk, eh, you know, I got, got, better go to church. It's, bless the Lord. His winnowing fork is in his hand, church. This wonderful God we serve who made provision, if you don't exercise what he granted, people are going to be cast into hell. That is a fact of life. It doesn't matter if you believe it or don't believe it. It's going to happen. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And there's an unquenchable fire. You know, a lot of people like to believe when, I'm, when I die, it's all over. If that was the case, I wouldn't have to worry about it, but it's not the case. Your spirit's eternal, church. Your soul's eternal. Your body will be burned up and made into ashes, but not your soul and your spirit. Forever separate from the Lord. You know what a bottomless pit is? It means there's no bottom. You're continually repulsed from God Continue, forever never allowed in his presence you take care of that now, you work out your salvation now, you do that in this lifetime now, and God is so good, he'll put people in your life who you wonder that there's something wrong with them God will use them to help fix you Anybody can love somebody that's lovable. Anybody can love somebody that's lovable. How about the person that's not lovable? How about the one you don't like? How about the one who greets you sometimes, sometimes they don't, who don't look you in the eye, you know, like, oh, that, you know, 
That's my ministry to them. And we do that and think it's okay, but you don't look at that. That you know, say I regard you with contempt. You, I don't even think you're saved. There I go, man. See, I passed that judgment. Now I have no responsibility towards that person. They go to the same church you do. They praise God. They might even tithe, but they walk past me and didn't even say hello. Don't they know who I am? I'm the senior pastor at this church, and they walk right by me. I mean, what's wrong with them? I don't know. What's wrong with me that I would judge them over that? If I think there was something wrong, I'd go up and say, hey, did I ever offend you? Is there something? And usually, oh, no, no. Okay, bus door, just want to make sure. Enjoy yourself. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. Jesus was humbling himself. He was going to the lesser, but he didn't look at John as the lesser. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Do you understand? This is before the resurrection. This is two cousins who kind of love God and have a ministry. And the one cousin saying, man, there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy of latch, and another one coming once baptized. And I love Jesus' answer. But Jesus answered, answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he permitted it. You know why Jesus got baptized? Do you know that Jesus had no need to repent? He couldn't make something up. <laughs> there was nothing. He was after, do you realize he was the only human being who walked earth? He was sinless. He didn't have to repent. But he got baptized. He went to a place where they're repenting and being baptized and got in the water to fulfill righteousness. Why? He saw that as a move of God and he wasn't involved in the move of God, went and got in the water. Of course, he got baptized. Sound comes from heaven, a dove comes from heaven. This is my beloved son, hear him. Boy, what a baptism. I'd like to have been at that one. You think you get goosebumps now when you get baptism, baptized or you see a baptism. Wait till that would happen. But he permitted it. And I say, and I and I like to challenge people to think about this. If you were baptized when you were a child, or say you were raised Catholic or, or you were born in a Catholic family or Orthodox, or or you went to a Baptist church and when you were 10 or 12 years old, they took you by the hand, led you to water baptism. That's, that's all good. If And if you understood that to, th to this day, it's sufficient for you, that's good. But if you didn't even have any choice in that, and you never, you know, you just went along with the program, didn't have no realization as, in, as an adult. Uh, you know, as an adult, I never said I want to be baptized. It was not my free choice. It was my parents leading me by the hand, which was a good thing. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. But if you've never, as an adult, got in the water to baptism on your own initiative, probably need to do that. You know, I had a brother who was helping us with the sound system. He heard me say that, and he'd been a Christian for years. I mean, long, and he's it's a straight arrow. And he says, you know, baptize as a child. But I really had no, I just, okay. And so went along with the program. He goes, you know, but I went as an adult that I chose to be baptized, and I chose as an adult to follow Jesus. And it's what we're to do. Bless the Lord. So John tried to prevent him, but Jesus said, let it be done and fulfill righteousness. But Jesus said, Nicodemus came to him at night. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. By the way, theologians are, are, uh, debate about the water, that it means the water is like entering into life. It's burst and you're born. But in light of the scriptures, it leans more towards baptism. You're to be baptized in the water, the water grave, and you're to raise a newness of life and enter the kingdom of heaven. So here's another issue. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said to the disciples, and by the way, here he's talking to 11 men. You know, we quote Matthew 28, 19 like he was talking to the entire church. He was talking to 11 men who he discipled personally, who he taught how to minister. He sent them out, they ministered, and he, the anointing was on them. Uh, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But he said to them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He gave that, that's called the Great Commission. And 
we're usually taught in this country that the Great Commission meant every single believer is to do that. There are believers that you can go out on a mission like that and really make havoc. People who are called to do that should do that. People who are gifted evangelists should do that. The man that has a prophetic gift and a preaching gift, he should do that. These men that he said that to were 11 men that he personally discipled. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and preached a sermon about it. So should you share your faith? Yes, one-on-one -on -one personal testimony, always give your testimony. We overcome how? By the blood of the Lamb, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, and the word of my testimony, look what the Lord has done. God's done something in your life, share it with somebody. Always share it with somebody. And you'll find that that's easier than you think. Don't, don't be backwards about those things. Share it, share with your faith. I mean, yeah, you know, I go golfing and I'll be up there and I'll see guy, guys from the mill. But if I see guys from the mill and guys say, man, I just had open heart surgery. And I said, you're still out here golfing? Man, God's been good to you. You thank God every day? I'm ministering to him. Do you thank God every day? Oh, I do. Every morning I get up, I, I say, do, you get, do, I, do I get a thank you, Jesus? You do that. And you'd be surprised, especially when you get down in life and death is knocking at your door and you got this going bad and that going bad. You'd be surprised how people are, oh, yeah, I thank God every day. I've, I've, I've had guys to me every morning when I get up, the first thing I do is say, thank you, Lord. You know? And there's a lot of people do that. But encourage that. Nurture that. Bring it along. Say it. I got people that say to me, when if they see on their ID that it's me calling to answer the phone, praise the Lord. I said, you're doing good. Can I? Uh, uh, my one buddy, he gets, I say, oh, come on. You can do better than that, can't you? I want to hear, praise the Lord. And when he answers the phone now, he goes, praise the Lord, Pastor Foley. He'll go, amen, praise the Lord. I don't want to tell you who he is, but do, do you realize somebody can't say that and something not happen to him? I don't care if he's just doing it to, to playing with me or appeasing me. You say praise the Lord long enough, the Lord's going to hear that and go, there really is me, and I really do want praise. Let God be God. Bless the Lord. But unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. You're not going to find that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Go into all the world. The disciples went in all the world and, and preached the gospel. And on the day of Pentecost, that was the first message where the promise is being fulfilled. And listen what Peter said. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is written on the wall there. And what I want you to see is this. He says, therefore, uh, go make disciples, baptizing them. And look, he says, the name, the name. Just singular, right? The name, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, he said that. There was 11 men there. He said that. Peter heard that. Do you think Peter understood it? On the day of Pentecost, then when he got up and he said, be baptized in the name of, did he misinterpret? That is the name. There is no other name. All that we do in word and deed, we're to do in the name of Jesus, even water baptism. We're to baptize in the name of Jesus, not in a description of God. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're describing God. His name, the name that's above every name, the name that was given that will save you, is the name of Jesus, and that's the name you get baptized in. And by the way, don't judge people who don't do it that way. That's between them and their God. If they ask you, tell them the truth. Tell them what you believe and what you see. In Romans 6, 3 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? What do you mean by that? The unique thing about Jesus is that it's you do the will of God, that trumps your will. You can have things you want to do and get to do, but God trumps it. In other words, my will is first and foremost to God that I do his will. I don't do my own thing. I do God's thing. By the way, in my lifetime, I'll say this. God is not a hard taskmaster. He's never burned me out. Every time he's given me something to do, a blessing came out of it. And every time I needed rest, there was a season of rest came. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to, in other words, I never have to worry about, well, when am I going to get some sleep? When am I going to do this? How am I, I don't have to worry about that because it always just works out. So you just trust the Lord, walk with him. I give my, my will now is to do his will. And it's the only thing we can give God that an animal can't. We're the only creature that by, we can choose 
to do your will. An animal just does what they do. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism unto death. What do you mean? I died in myself. In order that as Christ is raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in what? Newness of life. I found a new way of living. What's that new way of living? I do the will of God. What's doing the will of God? Well, how about this? I think a negative thought about somebody, and I just know that thought's not a good thought. Well, doing the will of God is to get rid of that thought. Well, how about I get up in the morning, get up, and I got something to do, and I, I'm upset about it. I'm grumbling. Like, why do I got to do that? Well, you, you're the one that has to do it. And you, and you grumble around and go do it, and you're, and you're, you're pouting. Do you, are you doing the will of God? I'm asking you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that three or four of you know that. The rest of you grumble along, and you'll get it. It doesn't work. We're to do all things with a good attitude. We're to do, you know, we're to delight in life. Enjoy life, whatever you're doing. I don't care if it's washing dishes, scrubbing the floor, or playing golf. Whatever it is, you do all, do everything to the glory of God. Always do things with a good attitude. And if you got a bad attitude, check it at the door. When's at the door? When you wake up in the morning. Don't, don't even start your day without it. That's why it's good to read your word in the morning. I, I, I can't read at night because I get fall asleep. Yeah, I read every morning. How, how, you want to start your day a little bit better? It's sure not sugar-frosted flakes. And it's sure not sugar-coated word. It's the pure word. It's like the great vitamin, man. It just <laughs> it does you. If we're to walk in newness of life, and if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. What's that mean? Again, not my will, but thine be done. And understand, God will not tempt you beyond what you're able. He won't put on you what you can't handle. God knows what you can go through and what you can get through better than you do. A whole lot of us have been through things we thought we'd never get through. And, you know, but you, here you are, still going. So why can we trust God? How about for this reason? For in him, why we trust the Lord. In him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you've been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. Nothing can be done to you without his permission. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before man, that's part of our baptism, the Son of Man shall confess before the angels of God. And he goes on and says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him when the Son of God will be ashamed when he comes in the glory in his glory and the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. And the Apostle Paul says it this way, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then speaking of all of us, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised up with him through the, through the faith and in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. For he who has died is free from sin. Listen to this. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're not dead to sin, but you're to consider yourself dead to sin, and you're to avoid sin like the plague, and you're to deal with yourself and grow in grace, and His grace is sufficient for you. For we're alive to Christ. We're always aware of what He did for us, and we're always aware of your spirit, your attitude, your outlook on life. Get it all right. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. That's a fact. He who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And the last scripture I have for you is 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you have been bought with a price. Let me hear you. You've been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Utilize the gift. Appropriate the grace of God. Let him enlighten you to the word and the ways you should walk. Let his Holy Spirit convict you when you do wrong, when you've got a grumpy attitude, when you're feeling sorry for yourself, when you're full of complaints, and you go, why, why me? Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Help me, Lord. And he's a very help in a time of trouble. But if you're grumbling about it, he's not going to help you. When you quit grumbling, the help will come. Things will work out. You'll have a testimony. If you walk in faith and you walk in the right spirit, you will always have a testimony saying, look what the Lord has done. God will do things for you. Things will work out that doesn't look they, like they could work out. Do you understand? We're sitting in something that just worked out. Kind of obvious. Bless the Lord. Well, anyhow, if you've given your heart to Jesus and you've never been in the waters of baptism, get in the waters of baptism. Understand that it's a water grave 
You die to self and you raise up to newness of life. You walk in this wonderful life and this adventure of walking with Jesus and walking in faith. So bless the Lord. Again, if anybody's watching this on YouTube, if you've never been baptized, get in the waters. Go talk to your pastor about water baptism and uh, make that profession of faith. Get buried in the water grave that you might rise to newness of life. Father, again, we give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you, Lord, that you made provision. You made a way uh, where there was no way. Lord, we were helpless without you, but you are a very help in a time of trouble. And Lord, we realize we're in trouble when we're separated from you and far from you. So, Master, bless as only you can. Grant salvation. Grant grace. Lord, bless our country. Let us return to our roots. Let us become indeed a nation under God that serves you, loves you, and keeps your commandments. For those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. So, Father, have your way. Save us all. Bless as only you can. And we ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Praise band, please come.